We all know we're heading into it now and everything's starting to ramp up and uh, getting all the preparations in, in order for Christmas days. What we need in that sort of busy, sort of chaotic season that we find ourselves in is, is fresh perspective. So listen to this story um, that, that I heard about a, uh, a British preacher by the name, he's an old school preacher, and he was, uh, he's called Dick Lucas, and he's a, he's a great preacher, I like him a lot, but he, he wrote this story, he's from London. Uh, he didn't write it, sorry, he was reciting it, and I thought I'd do the same. So it's about a student, this is about helping us gain perspective. It's about a student, and he was writing home at the end of term before he was about to go home for his Christmas holidays. And he writes to his parents saying, uh, Dear Mum and Dad, sorry you've not heard from me in such a long time. It's been a difficult period for me. First a fire, gutted my flat, and I only escaped by jumping out the window and getting a broken leg for my pains. Then in hospital, I met this super nurse. We married last Saturday. My friends don't think our very big differences in age and social and national background and political background will matter at all, as we're so very much in love with each other. And then, sorry, we, we got married, and now she's found out she's, she's pregnant. And then as the parents turned the next sheet of the letter, it said, well, so far, everything I've written is actually untrue. Don't worry, none of this ever happened. But what did happen last week was that I failed my exams. And before I come home, I just wanted you to get this failure in perspective. Okay, so nice, nice little story there about getting everything in perspective, laying the ground there. The reality is that we, we can lose perspective, can't we, over, over Christmas. Like I said, we're everything competing for our attention. And so what we need to do, and one of the wonderful blessings that we have of coming together as a church, is we come, and as the Bible says, that's why it says don't negate, don't forget the meeting together of one another, because not only do we come with our primary purpose of praising God and thanking God for who he is and what he's done, but it's an, in, an encouragement for one another. And so when you read through the New Testament, it says encourage each other continually, encourage each other with these words that Christ is coming back, the victorious one is coming back. And so as we meet together, we, encourage, we are encouraging one another, not just his first advent, but his second, that Christ is coming back. So, uh, as I said, on this sort of crazy, sort of secular, uh, materialistic conveyor belt that we find ourselves on, where we can quite easily lose perspective about what Christmas is truly all about. Maybe for some of us, it's just become all about holidays, and it's about time off, and it's about family, and it's about presents, and it's about food, and it's about turkey, and it's about ham. None of these things are inherently wrong, of course. I'm looking forward to enjoying a lot of them myself. But just to remind one another as we gather together what it's, what it's all about, and we find perspective, don't we, by encouraging one another to look towards God and remember what his word says. You know, I was asking my son uh, yesterday, Amy and I, so we were saying, Barnabas, what is Christmas all about? And he said to us, it's about Lucas. Okay, and Lucas is over there. Uh, the, the, well, he's not over there right now, but the, the son of Tian and LJ. And I said, why is that? Because He says, because it's about Lucas's birthday. So my son, the pastor's son, thinks Christmas is all about Lucas's birthday. Okay, and we had to remind him, no, in fact, it's not. What is it about? And he was, just thinks it's about chocolates or it's about whatever. And it's like, this is the pastor's son. We need to get this ironed out before anyone finds out at church, okay? <laughs> But it's too late because it's come from me. But sometimes we just, we just don't know. Sometimes we just haven't been told. Sometimes we just get bombarded with everything and we lose perspective. Maybe other reasons might be that we lose our perspective of what it's about because of over-familiarity, right? And I think we can all resonate with that to some degree, particularly if we've all grown up uh, in America or in a, a country of Christian roots. We just hear the story and we see it sort of pasted around on the periphery, and we become over-familiar with it. And so when we come to it again at Christmas time, we almost shut off to it because we think, well, I've just heard that story before, and we just become a little bit desensitized to the, to the wonderful mystery of Christmas. But God, in his mercy and his love, knows we're like this, knows we're like sheep that are prone to stray, and so what he has given us are these two greatest aids to help us, and that is his Holy Spirit, 
to guide us and to lead us. And he has given us his word. And so what Luke has done here as we turn to uh, Luke chapter 2. In fact, let's read that now. Luke chapter 2. And we'll pick up uh, from verse 8. And that will be up, I think, on the screen. There we go. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. What Luke has recorded to us is something to help remind us the story, the testimony, the perspective of eyewitnesses to help us look towards Jesus this Advent. Okay, so it says, Luke writes, chapter 2, verse 8, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Now it would make Uh, perfect sense wouldn't it as it's a multitude for you lot to join in with me okay so shake off your Sunday morning blues and say with me in best choir voice verse 14 glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased all right stop showing off now I'll take it from here verse 15 when the angels went away from them into heaven The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all of these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And this is the word of God. So as I said, what what Luke has done here is with great care and great attention laid out for us all of the facts and the reason why he and indeed all of the gospel writers have written, which is to provide a historical eyewitness account of the life and the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, so that we might find and worship Jesus for ourselves as Saviour from our sins and from God's judgment as the Lord of our lives. That's why the Gospel writers have, have written that we may know he is Lord and worship him. So Luke alongside Matthew actually include the birth. Okay, John, he starts well before the birth actually. He goes right back to the eternal word to, because there is no beginning, he describes Jesus. He says that he has always been there. In the beginning was the word and the word became God. Okay, he became flesh. So it speaks about in John chapter 1 about how, or points to his eternality. And then Mark's a little bit different. So scholars say that Mark was probably the first gospel to be written. And it's a lot shorter, a lot more punchy, and uh, a lot more brief. And he jumped straight in at the ministry of Jesus. So you have to turn to Matthew, and you have to turn to Luke to find more about his birth. And what Luke does here at the beginning of his, uh, his gospel, his eyewitness account, is he includes various perspectives and various testimonies such as those as the shepherds and so whilst they were the we assume the only ones there the shepherds we assume that they have passed on this testimony to others people such as Luke and their testimony that they've received is speaking of an announcement that came to them whilst they were out watching their sheep as the famous cow goes by night they received an announcement And so you can remember last week, we looked at another announcement, didn't we, from Isaiah, where Isaiah came and he announced there was a birth to come 700 years later, and that's where we find ourselves, 700 years later, the announcement, the birth has actually come. It's here, the stage is set. And so it's to these shepherds that the angels bring another announcement, a message, because that's what angel means, it means a messenger. Now, we don't know who it was. It could have been Gabriel, perhaps. So when we look at how uh, it's announced to, to Mary, that comes through the angel Gabriel. So we don't know who it is, but what, whoever it was that brought this message, this is what we know. We know what they said. 
And it says, picking up on verse 10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign. You'll find him, find him lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling cloths. And the interesting thing is that the shepherds, that many scholars believe, by the way, were the very people that were not considered worthy to either receive a message nor convey that message and pass on that message to, to, to others, are the very people that God chose to announce his birth to. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? So last week, again, we saw about how God looked at this forgotten, sort of God-forsaken area in the north of Israel, around the region of Galilee. God chose there to say he's going to shine his light. And now again, what God is showing us is that he picks the people that are on the periphery of society, the outcasts, those not considered credible, to appear to them and announce the birth of his child. So what we find here in announcing what is the, the, the greatest night of all time in the world that the world has ever known, on this beautiful night, is the good news that the Messiah has come. Now, I've already seen my fair share of beautiful nights here at, on Hawaii. Uh, for those of us uh, that have been living here our whole life, I wonder whether we've lost that perspective. We've just, you know, been so grateful for these wonderful sort of skies that we have at night. I know for those of us that haven't been living on this island very long at all, we would just look up and we go, this is amazing. You have a beautiful island. Thank God. What an amazing island that you can look up. So it's very hard to see this, yeah? So some of my favorite psalms speaking about uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. Yeah, that's pretty hard if you live in Manchester and you look up and you can only ever see a black cloud, okay? But when you're here on Hawaii, you can look up and you can see, yes, look at it. This is the handiwork of my God. Look how awesome and how clever and how great he is, what he's written with his hands by putting the stars in place. It's a wonderful place to be, to see that come to life. So, out of all the most beautiful nights I've ever seen here on Hawaii and you've ever seen, this night here, eclipses them all the most marvelous and the most beautiful of all nights the light of the world has arrived remember this is the fulfillment of what was written in genesis 3 5 the curse will be reversed of the seed of woman shall one come this is the announcement realized of isaiah chapter 9 about the light shining in the darkness here he is as i said the stage is set the promised one has arrived and we read in verse 13 that suddenly there was an angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising god and saying glory to god in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased and upon the announcement, what do the shepherds do? Well, follow me in the script. What do they do? They leave what they are doing, their sheep. They put them all aside to go and see the child. So they were out on the outskirts, both geographically, but also socially. These particular shepherds were perhaps uh, shepherds uh, that had been commissioned by the, uh, the temple hierarchy to look after the sacrificial lambs. This is what some scholars say. So they were particular shepherds that were in the vicinity of the area where they would say, right, you look after these sheep because we're going to need them for the sac sacrifices in the temple. But what we see, and if that's true, what we see is they're laying aside these sacrificial lambs to go and see the one true lamb that John said was the Lamb of God, they stop, they lay it all down to go and visit him and fall at his feet. So again, um, interesting points to note. The lamb of the world who himself was the good shepherd. So just to, to recap and re-emphasize that point again, isn't it great that God chose, chooses to show himself not to the religious hypocrites who failed to shepherd Israel, but he shows himself to shepherds that were rejected and on, the, again, the periphery of society, but to those lowly shepherds in the middle of nowhere at night. Well, they clearly thought it was great, and I know you agree with me, because it says in verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into, he and, and gone into heaven, the angels said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which God has told us about. So off they go, verse 16, it says with haste, 
Okay, like some of you will leave church to go home and have your, uh, your wonderful Hawaiian barbecue or whatever you're having at lunchtime, okay? So off they go when they hear this announcement with haste to go and find Mary and, and Joseph. And for those of us that have ever had the privilege of, uh, of giving uh, birth at hospital, can you imagine the feelings uh, that uh, Mary and Joseph must have thought as they're trying to sort of enjoy uh, this moment and these shepherds that they don't know come crashing into the birth scene saying, God sent us, here we are, we've come to see the child. Um, so when they get there, what do they see? They see a child wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. And this is a good point to, to pause and again to ask the Lord for perspective, to just realise and to just imagine just how beautiful the mystery of the incarnation is. Isn't that wonderful to think that Jesus, the darling of heaven, up in heaven who we've read about the angels worshipping, stoops down, comes down, to make himself as vulnerable child lying in this manger. So it's one of the most, I think, one of the most beautifully profound things for us to, to think about this Christmas. God incarnate, Emmanuel with us. And I want to encourage you all to just picture that for, for a moment. You know, the greatest gift that we could ever know is Christ given to us this Christmas. Now, we can all think, I'm sure, of dubious uh, Christmas gifts. I'm just, I, I basically see this pulpit as an opportunity to get some historical beef off my chest. Okay, so last week, I was speaking about some church members that gave me some mouldy chocolates. Okay, I'm just thinking of some other stuff as well, dubious Christmas gifts that I've been given, and I've been given all sorts. But I was guilty of giving bad gifts as well. So I think of when I grew up as a child in the 80s, yeah, the 80s, best time ever, 80s, best music, best everything, it was going on. Okay, my parents would, when they could afford it, uh, give us a little bit of money and they would say, right, go and buy your siblings and your mum and dad a present. It's usually something token, like, I don't know, $5 or something. Go and buy something nice or as nice as you can find um, from the shops. For those of us that are a bit more savvy, we have something in England called Poundland or Dollarland. You don't get that over here, right? That meant you could buy five presents, yeah, because that's what it, five times one, yeah? So you could buy five presents and they were rubbish and they probably didn't even last a day. But this is what we were given, five dollars to go and find each family uh, person a Christmas gift. And it's like there's this unwritten global manual Okay, which dictates from since the beginning of time what you must buy for both your father and your mother. And for your father, in the UK anyway, it was socks, okay, basically socks, or it's awful body spray. Okay, and then for your mum, it's like pyjamas and slippers or something, isn't it? And you can see my dad's face as every year he got the same present from each of his three children, dodgy socks and horrific smelling cheap body spray okay but he was just such a uh, he is a kind and gracious loving stepdad and he just took it thank you so much it's exactly what i wanted three times over thank you okay <laughs> thank you for these three sort of cans of uh, of of axe atlantis or whatever it was okay uh, you know i was looking this up actually what is the worst smelling um, yeah, that's what I do with my time. You're thinking, listen, do we pay you to look up stupid things like this? <laughs> okay, but I looked up, what is the worst smelling? We call it lynx. Okay, it sounds a bit more exotic and dangerous in England. Okay, we call axe lynx in England. And um, what is the worst smelling lynx you can find? And you'll never guess what it is, for those of you that have been over that area. It's lynx marmite. Yeah, isn't that bad? You don't know what Marmite is, look it up. It's like some ye <laughs> it's yeast extract, okay? And it's as bad as it sounds, okay? And you definitely don't want to be spraying that over your body unless you want to get attacked by a bear or something, I don't know. But anyway, listen, regardless, and this is what I loved about my, I love about my, my, uh, my parents, is that regardless of the fact they got these horrible sort of Christmas gifts, they realised that family, of course, is beautiful and they had this there was this time where we came together and these gifts were just symbolic okay it's symbolic so don't let it rule you and dictate your life don't get into debt and let these things sort of stress you out okay they realized it was symbolic of pointing us towards the greatest gift that has been given to us and the greatest gift church this morning that has been given to us is God's son Jesus Christ a child has been given to 
you. So for those of us that maybe this year it feels a bit different, maybe loneliness or sadness, remember that the greatest gift that has been given to you is that you are not alone. God is with you, Emmanuel. And for those of us that are going to get socks or dodgy Marmite spraying axe, <laughs> sounds bad, doesn't it? it is. Or, or pyjamas or slippers or whatever it is, and you look at it and go, I spent a lot on your one and you've given me this. Remember, the greatest gift you can have this Christmas is, is Jesus. And as the shepherds arrive then, back to the script, as the shepherds arrive, and I'm sure they're overwhelmed with joy at this profound encounter with God the Son. Can you imagine what they were thinking as they arrived? They think, this is God. God's here in, in the arms and in the, bo the bosom of, of Mary. He's there. Amazing. What do they do? They begin to tell Mary and Joseph all that the angels had said concerning the child. Verse 17, it says, And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child, which is good news. The angel said, this is good news for you from God. This is great joy for you from God. Joy to you. This is peace, peace on earth between God and man with whom he is pleased to dwell. And then picking up in verse 11, it says, Today in the town of David, that's a fulfillment, that the, the, the line of David will continue forever and ever. Here comes a saviour. So the shepherds are reciting what the angels told them directly, that the, the child there in your arms, Mary, Joseph, the, arm, the child in your arms is a saviour. He's going to save the world from their sins. The child that's been born to you today is the Messiah, the promised one of Israel, the fulfilment of the scriptures. And he is the Lord. He is the Lord, which in Greek is Kyrios, which means it means God. Or in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, it speaks of, it, it's pointing towards the word Yahweh or Jehovah. It's saying that the child in your arms is God. God in your arms, Mary. God in your arms, Joseph. Of course, they knew that, but to hear that again coming from the shepherd, can you imagine what it must have felt like? But as we, as we think now about about landing, so we've looked at some of those details of that familiar uh, passage. There are some further closing details that I want to draw to your attention at the end of this, at the end of this section, okay, concerning Jesus' birth. So the birth of Jesus and the words of the shepherd, do you see it, cause the people who hear it, do you see it, say it, if you can see it with me, verse 18 to what? To wonder? Verse 19, the birth of Jesus and the words of the shepherds cause the people to treasure what they have. It causes them to ponder about the words. In verse 20, it causes the shepherds to go off what? Glorifying and praising his name. That's what the arrival of Jesus leaves them doing. Wonder, treasure, ponder, glorify, praise him. And this is what I hope as we come together this Advent, this Christmas time, this time of reflection and gaining fresh perspective, this is what I hope will lead uh, you towards this Advent morning. Perspective that leads towards wonder, treasuring, pondering, glorifying and praising Jesus. And as we accept this invitation... And as we imagine gathering around that, that scene around the manger, as we wonder what the shepherds must have been thinking on that night, I'm encouraging us to, again, with fresh eyes, and may the Lord and the Holy Spirit give us fresh perspective, see again what is going on here. And th here's what I see. Let me give you a few. Number one, what I see as we gather around that manger with the eyes of our hearts, what I see is that Jesus, as I said earlier, left his home in heaven, to come and be born in an animal feeding trough. An animal feeding trough. That in our mess and our darkness, we might be given the promise of an eternal home in heaven. So he comes to us in our mess, that in our mess we might get to be with him. It's a wonderful uh, contrast that we see there as we consider it. Philippians 2.5 says, you must have the same attitude that Jesus had, brothers and sisters. You've got to think like this, that though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. 
Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He didn't give up his divine nature. He is always God, but he gave up his divine privileges, the adoration and the praise of heaven and the multitude of angels. He laid it all aside that he may become flesh, one of us. He goes on to say, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Isn't that wonderful to uh, consider those things as we gather around the manger this morning, that God, far more important than ever any president or any king or queen or royalty or aristocracy or important person around the world, God himself humbles himself and comes as a slave and is born in an animal, main, uh, an animal feeding trough that we might be made rich and be with him in heaven. So consider that. Next, we see how God so loves the world. He so loves every one of you here today. He so cares for you this morning that he sends his son to be born of a mother so that you might be born again and know him as father. So Christ comes. God gives his son to be born of a mother so that you may be born again to know him as your father. Do you see the divine exchange that is taking place here? Jesus was born to die in order that you might die to yourself and live. He was born to die that we might die and live. Wonderful uh, contrast that we see. John chapter 10, 10 says, I come that you may have life and you may have it to the fullest. Christ came to bring us life and that comes through his death and his resurrection. And we see that there as this child is born to die for the sins of the world. Remember what the angel said, he is a saviour. He will come and he will rescue your, your, his people from their sins that they may live and know life in its fullest. And this new life is for all that will come to the Son and put their trust in Him that will by faith receive this gift of eternal life and repent and say, and this is not saying some clever little articulated prayer, but coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I give you everything. I give you my life and I surrender and I'm so sorry I've made it about me. I want to make it about you. You be my Lord and my Saviour and may I follow you all the days of my life, my Lord and my God. Life to all who put their trust and their confidence in him. Next thing um, that's worth noting is as you follow through Luke's account, chapter 2, Luke records a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. You may be familiar with the story. He was a righteous and devout man, the Bible says, and he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. And the Holy Spirit stirred him up one day to go into the temple and he, the Holy Spirit also said to him, you will not die, Simeon, until at last you see what you've been praying for, the Messiah who will come. And as I said that day, the Spirit led him to the temple. And so when Mary and Joseph come to present the, uh, Jesus, the baby Jesus, as the, as the law required him to, Simeon was there. And he took the baby inside of his arms and he said this wonderful thing as he's praising God. He said, Sovereign Lord... Remember, he'd been waiting this whole time to see the Messiah. He said, Sovereign Lord, let your servant now die in peace. I have peace now, because I, I, I've, I've seen Jesus. I have peace now, as you have promised. And it says in chapter 2, verse 30, For I have seen your salvation. And one of the wonderful things that I see as we read through this chapter is that we can know peace with God. We can have forgiveness of sins. We can know the love of the Father. We can have and know this life. He is our Saviour. He is our Lord. He is our God. All by, like Simeon, holding on to Jesus. Holding on to him alone. Christ alone. Holding on to him. And that shows us, doesn't it, that there's nothing that we can do no effort or no merit that we could ever achieve or attain that gets us right with God. But it all comes being right with God, peace with God, by holding on, metaphorically speaking, holding on to this child, holding on to Jesus as our saviour. Wonderful uh, things to consider. Does that not, church, lead us towards wonder, treasuring, pondering, glorifying and praising as we imagine this, this scene. It's just such a heartwarming, beautiful picture showing us who God is in fulfilling his promises and all that he's spoken. 
that he should choose to announce to the arrival of his son, not to kings, not to queens, not to high priests, not to nobility or the well-known of the day, but to these working class, ordinary blokes on the periphery of society. Showing us again, like he said in Isaiah, how he comes to those who think they don't deserve it and are forgotten, he, who come and find his one and only son. And in response, in conclusion, I can't help but, but find what is not just a one-off story here to be read each Christmas, okay, to children and to those that we love, but an ongoing invitation to us this morning given by God himself to, that says, come and see my son. Come and see him. You say, Pastor, how can I see Jesus? This was 2,000 years ago, but the invitation is to come with the eyes of our heart by faith to Christ. And and whether we've been walking with the Lord for many, many years, the invitation is still there. Come and see Christ. See why he came. See what he's done for you. See how he has given himself to, to you. Come by faith. You know, Thomas, one of the disciples who doubted Jesus had been, had risen from the dead, had heard all of his friends and his disciples say, we've seen the Lord, Thomas. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hand, if I don't put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I, I will never believe. I just cannot believe. But eight days later, Jesus does appear to Thomas, doesn't he? Doesn't he? And he says, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I wonder today whether you find yourself in church hearing others talk about their belief in God and who this child is, believing it with all of their heart, but you find yourself more resonating with Thomas. Unless I see, I will never believe. But Jesus says to you today, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Come and see my son. And this, friends, is what countless people have done throughout the ages. They've heard that invitation to come with the eyes of their heart to see Jesus and by faith believe from presidents to royalty to scientists to artists to composers to celebrities to ordinary people like me and ordinary people like, well, like some of you here this morning, okay, who have found Jesus because he came and revealed himself to us. You see, the shepherd's testimony is our testimony as well, where we realise that though we are undeserving, We really are dead in our trespasses, rebellious against God that he has come and revealed himself to us as God did through the angels on that night before the shepherds and he has shown us who he is and we have responded to that awakening and we have gone to to Christ at the foot of his cross and knelt down and said, my Lord and my God and my Saviour. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace amongst those with whom he is pleased. He is pleased. Those that genuinely meet with Jesus are met with wonder, treasuring, ponder, glorifying and praise. In this Advent series, Aloha Nani Church, I hope that as we hear and we recognise that continually, that continual calling, there's a continuing calling for us, not just to come one side of the cross and then forget about it, but the continuing, continued calling to keep coming back to Christ and to marvel at what he has done. The, the shepherds have helped us gain that perspective this morning, right? As they come to Christ and they realise all that he has done for, for us. We don't deserve this. But Christ has come for you this morning. And so like the shepherds and all those that realise that, we come and we bow and we marvel at Christ and we go away praising and thank, thanking him for all that he has done. The shepherd's song is now our song. Come see what our Saviour has done.